Me and you, Willem, welcome. Um, I want to see them not It's good to see you all. Uh, welcome to the business committee meeting. I'll call the meeting to order and the chair will acknowledge that it is with great respect and humility. We honor or we acknowledge and honor the lands of the Sinemic people. The Sinemic people maintain their profound, unique and spiritual connection to the land through ages, traditions, teachings, stewardships and expressions of reciprocity. We also acknowledge that some of us are meeting on the lands of the Sinemina's people or the Sanawas people, so welcome. Um, are there any additions, deletions or changes in order to the agenda? We have, Mark? Yeah, we have one. Um, it's the report for the Safe Schools Committee. They'd like to uh, We're going to, to under new business. We're going to hold off and do that at the um, open at the end of the month. That was decided okay. by staff. OK, you bet. Thanks, Mark. Um, OK, seeing none, um, I'll ask for uh, a motion to approve the agenda. Uh, Chantel uh, and Greg, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes that the minutes of the business committee meeting held on October 9th, 2024 be approved. Uh, Tim and uh, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, we have no presentations this evening. So we'll move on to 8.1 senior staff reports, Secretary Treasurer Mark Walsh and um, Associate Secretary Treasurer Tanya Sutton with the first quarter financial report. Great, thank you so much, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so what you're seeing this evening, uh, the Q1 report, uh, according to our uh, policies of reporting and board oversight of our financial position generally, this is what we, this is our typical report that we provide. Couple of points just at the get go is Q1. If if you think about uh, the way that our system runs, our fiscal year runs uh, July 1 to June 30, which means that in Q1 we're really looking at two months of our quote unquote business is actually really not functioning, and so we. We're we're really a 10 month organization in, in many ways, or at least the vast majority of our expenses are spent in 10 months. And so you wouldn't expect Q1 um, to you know be kind of equal to future future quarters. And so uh, small, small numbers, and that's why we give previous year comparators uh, to be able to give a sense of, of where we are. The second thing that's a bit more difficult is as I think we've talked about when we do our preliminary budget and we say we you know fund this X number of teachers to school X and then all of a sudden a whole bunch more kids come in in the summer to that school we automatically go and issue staffing but we don't necessarily actually have the revenue for those kids until the end of September, which of course is after the end of Q1. And so we have a little bit of a disconnect. So, so frankly, Q2 and the amended annual budget is really uh, the important time. And then of course the year end is, all, is also important. So th this is, a, I guess, a temperature check of how we're doing, but not the best metric um, of, of oversight and, and to dig too, too deep. However, there are a couple of points that I'd like to, to, to point out here. And so on page 10 of the agenda or page two of that particular report, if you compare 2023, uh, 24 to 24, 25, you'll see we're kind of in line of exactly where we would want to be with respect to uh, revenues and expenses uh, down the line. Um, but I really, really would like to highlight when you go to the substitutes line under the expenses under the operating fund and you see last year we um, you know, spent 8% of our anticipated uh, expenditures by this particular point. And you know, if it was 10, if it was, you know, 10 months, then you'd think it would be 10, about 10%. But 
this year we're at eight percent great right on right on where we need to be but what's really interesting is look how much that number has gone up year over year so we budgeted yes salaries have gone up yes we have a few more teachers and neas but we budgeted 5.381 million dollars last year we've budgeted 6.732 million dollars for absenteeism and we are hitting exactly where we thought we were going to be from from year to year so um you know big concern something that continues to be uh, needed to talk about the sum of it has to do with um, increased access through the employment standards uh, act to, to sick time you know continue people are calling in sick when they're not well that's that's what what it's there for uh, but we still need to take some time and we'll be doing that as an organization to see if there's any other factors that that we can have any influence on uh to to address that issue because that is um an enormous year over year uh increase and one that we anticipated so uh i mean good news in the sense that we weren't um i guess being overly pessimistic about the that number but bad news in the sense that we've actually met what we what we thought would occur so that's that's the first that's the first one I, I think that that's warranted uh, to note on that particular circumstance. With respect to special purpose funds, you'll see the Q1 is again not the best metric to see where we're at because the revenues and expenditures are either so small amounts or the timing of the expenditures mean that it's difficult to to, to compare uh, year over year. So uh, just a couple of things. Uh, to, to note in that circumstance. So overall, we have really no concerns where we are with respect to budgetary, and we'd have concerns both if we were underspending or we were, <laughs> excuse me, overspending, but it will be Q2 that's going to be uh, the, the big, uh, the big decider to see exactly how the barometer to see how we're doing overall. You'll see uh, increases up to September 30th of staffing, uh, changes, uh, nothing very significant, and they are explained uh, in the notes. Uh, the final thing before I turn it over to questions that I would actually like to point out is uh, a number of years ago, we came to the board and the board supported a policy, uh, a bit more of an active investment policy. And so you'll see on page 13 of 31, um, we started actively investing, uh, you know, dollars that are on hand. So we have a child care build and they give us the money up front, but we know we're not going to spend the money for a year and a half uh, going in, into investments, either GICs or sitting in a central depository program uh, with the government. The government uh, CDP is they've, they've lowered their interest rate a little bit and we've uh, made a, a couple of wise choices to lock in uh, at slightly higher rates, anticipating lower interest rates. Uh, so we're taking a bit of a hit um, this year on, on lower interest rates generally from what we were budgeting. However, we are, uh, that blow has been softened by our kind of proactive in investment. And again, want to be clear, these are guaranteed GICs. We're not investing in Dogecoin or it's Tesla or anything like that, but uh, you know we we have locked in f at four and a half percent essentially for four years, four million dollars, um, and that actually pays if you do that math on what that interest rate is, even a percent or two difference, and that's actually a significant budget hit. So, really want to express um, appreciation for that policy as well as the work of the finance team in monitoring uh, monitoring that kind of. A revenue that we actually have a little bit of control over. So capital is there as well, not a lot to report. Uh, so happy to answer any questions, but overall we're quite satisfied with where we're, we stand at this particular point after Q1. Thanks so much, Mark. Are there any questions? Uh, Tanya? Sorry, I couldn't figure it. I couldn't find the button to unmute and turn my TV, my video back on. So, Mark, you actually kind of started, you, you hit on it. So we've, because I was concerned about the interest rate changes. So given that they're GICs, that's really our only 
option? Are we feeling relatively secure given the potential upheaval in the world with all of the changes down south with how we've got our money locked up? Well, so through you, uh, Chair, they are insured as well. And so we are quite safe. We haven't taken any uninsured risk with respect to with respect to, to those and they are all domestic uh, as well. So we haven't we haven't dabbled in anything higher risk as an example. It's just locking in slightly higher GIC rates than we would get through the CDP program. OK, thank you. I just and I only asked because of some reading I've been doing in my own life and I get very confused by all these things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Mark. Just two quick questions. Um, and this I know I've just forgotten on the operating fund. Who are the other professionals under um, expenses and salaries? So the other professionals under expenses and salaries as an example would be uh, myself uh, and and that type of uh, level manager. You'll note that um, even though our senior educators are also educators, they would be other professionals rather than administrators the way that the, the ministry would require reporting. So so our facilities managers are going to fall under there. Again, the, the department managers, etc., plus our senior level educators from, I believe, the district um, director level up would be other professionals and then and district principal kind of down would be on the education side would be administrators. OK, so all but all employees of the district, not people contracted out. No contract okay. contracted out under other professionals wouldn't be there. They'd okay, be thanks. under so supplies and services. Thank you. Um, and Madame Chair, can I have a follow up? Yeah, go right ahead, Jeff. OK, thanks. Um, on the first page of your report, Mark, um, it talks about the COLA, the 1%, um, but it says something about all expense categories then go up 1%. Is that how, is that how benefits work? If you get a 1% wage increase, that benefits then go up the corresponding 1%? That wasn't how I thought it went, but I could be wrong. Well, so if if I make a uh, hundred dollars and our our um, way, so so what we do is, as you know, we apply a percentage depending on the 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 benefit package associated with the, the various groups. So twenty five percent is an example. We apply that on top of the salary that you'd get. So a hundred person making a hundred dollars, we'd apply twenty five as an example. If we if they get a one percent increase, we don't increase the twenty five percent addition, but we certainly do increase the um, the at least the wage sense wage sensitive benefits. So if I'm making 101, we times that by the 25%, just like when I was making 100. So we don't change our our wage. Um, we don't increase our benefit cost in the sense that we don't increase the percentage that we apply to the salary. But certainly if you have CPP, if you have pension, if you have uh, <clears throat> uh, sick leave, I suppose, those are going to all be all more expensive based off the salary that you earn. OK, thanks. Can I just quickly ask just one last question regarding to that, then I'm done. Yeah, um, go ahead, Jeff. Th thank you. Because um, it says that 1% equals 1.85 million, um, but I didn't see that reflected in the. Th I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out just so I'm reading these numbers okay. correctly. So. But but there's like services and supplies in there. There's other things, unless I, I could be reading it wrong. But it looked like salaries were 1. 1.132 million. But then everything altogether is 184. I, I, I was just trying to be clear on it. That's all. Okay. Well, Jeff, maybe I can take it away and and sure. we can just email back and forth, and I'll share the response with with trustees as well, if that's okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah great. Thanks. I'm just it's just for my own. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you have a question? Uh, 
Uh, looks like um, Chantel was before me, I think. Is that correct? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Chantel? Yeah. Well, I'm looking at the timestamp and it was exactly the same time. So <laughs> maybe I did it like three seconds before you, Tim. Um, you were before me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, through you, Chair, uh, if you could uh, just tell us what the small reduction to the original estimate for the skilled trades BC revenue as available funding under this program was slightly less than the year prior prior year. Um, how much less is it this year than it was last year? So I think it's twenty two thousand dollars was the the change. But my understanding, which I and I'll double check, but my understanding is that's enrollment driven. Oh, interesting. So it's uh, but twenty two thousand in the scheme of things is very is is a small amount. So we we would have just over projected and then came in slightly lower. But I, I will I will certainly get back if that's if that is not correct. But that's what I understand it to be. I would I would like to if if you could um, that would be great. Um, yep. If if you can find that out that'd be awesome. So it, it re was reduced by twenty two thousand dollars. Well, or it, it is now twenty two thousand dollars. We're reduced by twenty two thousand because what would have occurred is we got less funding. We already know we would have got less funding from our our initial budget, and so we've dropped that total overall for Q one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So just like this, just as an example, our September thirty number. So we we our enrollment went up by whatever it went up from what we projected. We have a huge amount of additional revenue associated with that. None of that is reflected in this because we got the money after September 30. Alternatively, had we missed, had we been below enrollment expectations, you would, and, and it happened before September 30 as an example, you would see decline revenue the same way you do with the skilled trades. Okay, thank you. You have a follow up, Chantel? <clears throat> nope. <laughs> OK, Tim, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the report. Um, financials. Uh, my question is just around international students. I know that mm -hmm. I was reading about um, uh, one of the districts recently just are just doing staff cuts uh, when it comes to um, because of their international enrollment being down. Um, so it made me think about the security and probably prevention mode of our district because I know that we rely heavily a little bit, to, not heavily, but we do rely on some of the international student funding that we do receive in the district. So um, maybe, I don't know if Rob Hutchins has his work cut out for him because I know that he runs the international um, student part, but um, so I'm just wondering um, what we're what we're doing or whatever to sort of prevent something like that happening in our district when it comes to um, um, having to cut back and and having uh, staff cuts because obviously we want to prevent that. So thank you. Sure. Th thanks so much for the question and, and through you, Chair. And we probably want to bring Rob in to maybe do a bit of a presentation, but I, I know the program pretty darn well. And so coming out of COVID, so our district didn't really have a huge, you know, we were making big investments in that pro program. Uh, and then coming out of COVID, we we started to really highlight uh, the opportunity, both from a financial perspective, but as well as it's a you know the the opportunities that international students bring for our domestic kids. And I want to be clear by that I don't mean you know meeting other kids from other countries is amazing and it's a good benefit. But what I mean is if you're at Ladysmith and you get 25 international kids, that might be the difference between that extra chemistry class that Canadian kids take alongside them. So there's a huge benefit in schools. So what we've done, and so in addition to the revenue that we bring in, so for instance, Dover has a fourth VP this year funded fully from the international program mm -hmm. um, surplus uh, from what from what we what we were able to uh, to to bring in. And so Rob uh, and Lisa Tom um, and even myself have done, uh, you know, building relationships with agents. 
they go to fairs. Uh, they go visit a variety of, of countries and not too much. We have a limited budget for that as well. We are promoting homestays because homestays is actually homestays and school capacities are our two biggest uh, hiccups to get students. We have a huge um, we have a huge demand for Nanaimo, and I will say I, I will praise Rob um, and his team for the relationships that they've built. As I've met some of the agents, and when I've had that opportunity, um, Nanaimo is like a place of choice. Not just because of the West Coast, not just because how beautiful and and a good reputation it has. It's also because of relationships, and so that kind of full court press of relationship building has meant that we've actually we're one of the few districts I think in the province that have seen an increase um, in our international enrollment and and so that's what we continue to do. A good example is we actually have to we have to say no to German kids as an example because it's we're in such demand because of those relationships um, and we don't want to pack a school full of one you know country or, or another but you know Rob was recently in China uh, Lisa Tom, I believe, is going to the Czech Republic to to uh, promote the program at a fair uh, coming up soon. So we're very cognizant of, uh, of that particular issue. And frankly, our biggest issue, Tim, right now is uh, if you know anyone that wants to be a homestay around Barsby, that would be great. If you know anyone that wants to be a homestay near Ladysmith, that would be great. And then if you know how we're going to get like another you know, 300 seats at Wellington built in a week, that would also be great. But uh, we're in pretty good shape. And again, I think probably Rob should come and talk to the board at some point about the program. Maybe a follow-up. Follow um, yeah, just maybe maybe that is a recommendation because it, it seems like it is a, a big pro a big program for our district and it probably would be good beneficial for our, probably us as trustees to meet with Rob just to hear how the program goes and works and under, understand it a little bit more. Um, if we could, I'm just throwing that out there. Thank you. And I could tell you that he would love to come and talk to you. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Uh, I see no other questions, so we'll move on to 8.2. Uh, Rutherford reopening, um, catchment boundary minor review with Mark and Jillian Robinson, our executive director of communications. Great, thanks, uh, Chair, and I'll I'll kick it off and and ask Jillian to comment. So when you open the agenda, I bet you some of you gas went, oh no, what are they coming back to ask us this time? Uh, but as you'll recall, part of our uh, uh, recommendations included, you know, let's just get finished, let's get the borders essentially as we as we went out to to consult with, uh, and and so we can start communicating and getting the school ready for opening, and then have a couple minor issues left over from the consultation, and you'll see both of them. Uh, we believe we've addressed in a positive way. So one, <coughs> excuse me, was a cul-de-sac that we inadvertently had split in two. Uh, the parents expressed concerns. One side had no kids uh, yet. One side had kids going to to McGurr. We just we're just recommending that that cul-de-sac will just get remain in the the McGurr catchment. The second one is associated with some concerns from the departure base Solaire area that wouldn't have impacted anyone uh, or at least existing students for 2025. Um, but we did look at the numbers and while it will kind of shrink Solaire's future numbers very, very slightly and increase departure bays very, very slightly. There is capacity based in the future, there would be capacity at Departure Bay at least uh, to ad address an issue that people brought forward and in good faith. And we thought that we would uh, recommend uh, being able to proceed with 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 the feedback that we got from the community. And so that's the, the really the two recommendations and this kind of ends uh, the process if the board is supportive of that. And so Jillian, um, maybe I can turn it over to you if you want to add anything. Oh, you're muted, Jillian. Sorry, it's hard to produce and Oops. and talk at the same time. Um, I, I don't have much to add, but I will mention that we looked carefully at every submission that we had for um, us to look at anomalies uh, within in the boundaries. 
Um, and those were two areas that stood out um, that we were able to address. Um, some of the things we did have requests for, you know, one side of the street and another side of the street, uh, often and sometimes on major routes. And it just wasn't possible to, you know, we looked carefully at how would we move this and what would this mean for other areas. Um, so what I can say is a lot of thought went into the impacts and what we could do um, and uh, careful consideration of all, all our boundaries. Uh, and this is where we came back. OK, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? If not, um, would someone be willing to move the motion? Well, Leanna, go ahead. Okay, uh, that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District Number 68, Nanaimo Ladysmith, approve the recommended minor catchment boundary changes as shown below in this action sheet. Thanks. I see it's seconded by Naomi. Did you want to motivate Leanna? Sure, yeah. Um, whoops. Oh no. Sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, some of these are my schools and this is my neighborhood. And there's some that are really obvious, like for example, Battersea Road, you'd have to walk up a gigantic hill, which is Nobody wants to do that on their way to school. It's a very, very steep, very busy, very loud hill. And this way you can just have a nice, flat, safe walk. I really, uh, I deeply know all of these streets and I feel like that makes sense. And half a cul-de-sac seems ridiculous. So well done, you guys, for saving that cul-de-sac. Great, thanks, Leanna. Um, seeing nothing in the chat. So if there's anyone opposed to the motion, could you please type it in? Okay, motion carries. Uh, moving on to 8.3, Public Interest Disclosure Act Annual Report, Mark. Thank you, Chair. And so the last year about this time, the board uh, was required to pass or place a policy on the Public Interest Disclosure Act. So this is essentially uh, you know, a whistleblower policy based off of provincial legislation that, that public sector entities are required to have. So we've passed that and then as part of the legislation, it does require a yearly report that essentially outlines um, the the number of disclosures that we've that we've had and and kind of general inform information uh, we did grab we kind of copied another school district's uh, attestation form which we thought was well done uh, we this in the last year we haven't actually had a report now I will say we do have um, plans though to to do a little bit more education on this policy because I'm not sure the system is completely aware so uh, the communications team did a marvelous job putting together a website with resources uh, that we will uh, that that that's on our website now, but it was it's only been a recent addition. We're adding this to our onboarding process so individuals are aware of it. And then we're going to get principals at a, a soon um, staff meeting, um, maybe not maybe probably December or January at latest to, to just remind their staffs that this is there and show them where the resources are available to them uh, and then add it to this kind of September staff meetings where we talk about bullying and harassment policies, etc. So uh, kudos to those uh, folks uh, focusing or that, that assisted in getting us to a place where we think that wider knowledge of this policy is going to be there uh, and not that we want you know a situation where we need anything reported but we certainly want people to know that it's there if reporting actually has to happen and we're confident that some of the education that we're that we're planning or the, at least the information we're planning are, is going to make that more accessible to folks so happy to answer any questions but obviously not a lot to report this year All right, thanks so much, Mark. Not seeing any questions. <clears throat> so we'll move on to 8.4, um, Administrative Procedure 5 th 513, Purchasing Update. 
And thank you, Chair. And so here uh, we we regularly reviewing APs. This is actually an AP that we've changed relatively recently to catch up with kind of inflation. Um, but in the there's two changes the, this evening that uh, we think are important. Um, one of them is essentially signing authority uh, associated particularly uh, with um, the the chair and we've picked here to put this and what, what this is for is the auditors. Um, you know, we had a great audit. Uh, it was very clean, but one of the things they did suggest and were very receptive to is we we had a system where it was actually the secretary treasurer that would be signing off on the superintendent's expenses as an example, which is you know, as you know, when you're reporting to someone, um, you know, not that that there was any any wrongdoing at all, but just from a security perspective and a best practice perspective, it's better to have the next person up the chain signing off of those expenses. And so, what we've done is we've actually incorporated the chair of the board specifically um, for the superintendent in in this uh, AP. So it's very clear um, that 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 occurs. So that's the first change. The second change is on page 25 and it's related to sole sourcing. And so the way what's what's been happening is or we have a situation or we've had situations where we're looking to um, purchase uh, the, you know, a welcome poll as an example. And a welcome poll is going to inevitably be higher uh, than many of our uh, you know, purchasing thresholds, given the quality, given the, the craftsmanship and the time uh, that it takes to do that. So, but what originally was required by the policy is this idea that we would go out and get three quotes. So it was a bit un incongruous with our Sayetsas, you know, way to go, okay, Nation, can you please give us three names of individuals that will give us quotes on creating a, a welcome poll as an example? And so, you know, what we want is the guidance of the nation to indicate, you know, the is the, in this example, you know, what that cultural symbol is going to look like on their t traditional territories. And so it what this allows us to do is be able to reach out to them and we've done this in the past but this is now very transparently incorporated in the purchasing policy that that's able to happen still needs sign off on by the superintendent or secretary treasurer um, but you know for instance uh, we're building the daycare at qqs we're looking to get funding to be able to support you know a welcome poll or something along um, that lines at the facility and we would want nanemo to tell us who is would be the person that would be able to or that that should be doing that work for us. And so um, ser or services also might apply uh, depending on on the threshold. Uh, so it's trying to incorporate say it's us in our um, in our particular uh, AP. So and those are the those are the two changes. Correct. Thanks, Mark. Mark, I appreciate the transparency just because it makes it clear for everyone when these things do come up. Um, is there anyone that has any questions? No? Okay. Um, so moving on to 8.5. Um, inclement weather. Pete Langstrad, our interim superintendent, is going to. Talk to us about snow. Hopefully not for a long time. <laughs> uh, good evening, Chair, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, and good evening. Um, yes, uh, inclement weather. Um, yeah, given the stormy weather today, uh, it starts a per uh, person begins to think about uh, the white stuff. And uh, so I'm happy this evening to share with you some information around inclement weather and what we do. Um, and I'm going to uh, invite Mark and Jillian to contribute at any point here. Um, so yes, uh, beginning late September and ending in late March, uh, facilities staff start planning for the possibility of snow. And 
Um, approximately 15 pieces of equipment, $15,000 of road salt, and $27,000 of sidewalk de-icer are basically stockpiled um, in preparation for an average of maybe 10 events per year. I'm always amazed at how much things cost. Who would think that road salt cost $15,000? Um, Labor is interesting. So an individual event costs the district about $12,000 in labor, um, not including the cost of caretakers. So we have about 32 caretakers that we deploy on any given day when there's snow. And labor is diverted from maintenance and operations duties. So carpenters, plumbers, electrical, grounds, custodial, etc. And the last bit there is the QP collective agreement allows it for up to two snow days per employee and employees get a day off in lieu if they work on a snow day. So the way it works is on a morning when there is a possibility of snow, uh, our transportation manager um, begins at about two o'clock in the morning and starts gathering information on road conditions. And it's also used by the superintendent or the designate to decide if schools are going to remain open or be closed that day. Um, superintendent typically also speaks with facilities uh, just to get an input on the condition of school sites, you know, parking lots, city streets, uh, et cetera. Um, so the decision typically gets made at six o'clock in the morning, but definitely no later than 630. And there's basically four things we can do. Uh, we can close schools. Uh, we can cancel the buses, but leave the schools open. We can cancel our special needs buses and have other buses running and the schools be open. And we can just simply operate as normal with the schools being open. Uh, once the decision is made, uh, Jillian contacts the principals and the vice principals, local radio stations, sends a message out to all families through school messengers, uh, sorry, school messenger, and also posts an, an alert on our website. Um, priority of snow removal. So we begin with plowing, salting, sanding, uh, bus drop-offs, uh, staff and student parking. Then we remove snow from interior sidewalks and ramps and main entrances and exits. And then we go on to our city sidewalks, which we are responsible for. Um, our plowing and salting crews are called out at about midnight um, with our day shift operators and shoveling crews starting at six o'clock in the morning. And extended events are a challenge for us. So, you know, the, the joy of living on the island is uh, we'll get a big dump of snow, but then it typically warms up or rains and things tend not to last for too long. Uh, but sometimes we'll get a multi-day storm and that can certainly be a challenge for us. Um, and just a final note. Um, Prior to living on Vancouver Island, I had a farm in central Alberta and a snow day for me was when my four wheel drive pickup truck um, could not get down the driveway when the snow was higher than the hood of my pickup, which was about three and a half, about three meters. And so, you know, it's all relative is the final thought that I have there. But uh, Jillian or Mark, is there anything that you would like to add? Sure, maybe I can just briefly add uh, one thing that um, and I, the, the the previous board certainly uh, I think you know held in the oversight role uh, held our feet to the fire to make sure that we're doing our darndest to meet municipal requirements and be good neighbors with respect to uh, snow removal on sidewalks and uh, you know the facilities team and our crews have really um, I think improved that over the last number of years uh, both by their planning, but as well as you know, board-supported investments um, in in equipment, uh, both plows for to attach to our existing equipment, but also a bobcat that we're able to to move around. That's been a very successful in <clears throat> be maybe not being perfect yet with respect to all our requirements, but certainly um, much improved. And so I, I just want to acknowledge uh, that that change over the last couple of years. Jillian, anything to add around communications? 
Yeah, I'd just like to highlight that we refined our communications process for reaching out to staff and families uh, this year uh, when we are closing or there's uh, changes or, or buses may not be running. Um, previously, we would have uh, utilized social media as one of the uh, priority of communications. Um, uh, pro, uh, tools that we use, but um, now because of the effectiveness of School Messenger and reaching parents directly on their phone um, with with uh, an email and a text message, um, as well as staff um, by email as well, and as well our, we will always reach out to local media and we will always update our school website. And those are the ways that people should expect to find out about school closures or uh, if uh, buses aren't running. Um, and then because social media, um, I think as many of you have recognized, there's been lots of changes in, in the last year or two years um, where those platforms have changed. Not everyone's on them. Um, they don't. Uh, it, most of you will know it's really impossible to find current information on Facebook. Um, so those platforms will be uh, where they used to be one of our top uh, in the order of where we uh, disseminate information, they are now the last. Um, so that's a change for this year, but we feel that we are um, able to reach families as uh, quickly as possible, ideally by six o'clock in the morning, um, to let everyone know when a snow day is going to happen. And I'll share with Pete's uh, snow information moving here. Uh, two years ago from Whistler, um, my daughters had their first ever snow days, and I can tell you it was a happy day in our house. Um, thanks, Jillian. Uh, and finally, Chair, I just would like to say that it's never an easy decision because you are always balancing safety uh, with inconvenience. And any time that we close our schools, uh, we know that for some families, um, it is simply an inconvenience, but I always think about um, the single parent working three jobs and uh, having to find childcare or having to stay home and not receive um, uh, any kind of pay for that day. So it is a difficult decision. Uh, we're always balancing that notion of safety um, for our students and families and staff with inconvenience that we know we are creating for families. Um, I see in the chat that there are a number of questions, Chair, so I'll turn it back to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pete. Uh, all right, Chantel. Hello, thank you for the report on this. Um, very timely and fantastic. It's always a question on people's minds. I was actually thinking about it today. Like, are we going to get snow this year? I don't know where I grew up. You know, we had snow up to the telephone poles, so up to the lines, the electrical lines. Um, we didn't have school for a week, which is awesome. Um, but our snow here is significant when it comes because of it being it's so, um, you know, when you get used to it, it's a lot easier. Um, but when it's just a few days out of the year, um, something like 10 events per per. 10 e event days per year. Um, I'm thinking about those those add on effects when we talk about um, our maintenance and operations department duties um, get shifted right from their regular duties and that slows down a lot of the things that they've already been working on. Um, I'm thinking about um, do we have enough like is there is there a, a need within the department to to create more positions perhaps or or temporary positions during the winter season or something like that to help sort of offset that um that extra work that needs to happen and it can happen for a long period of time too i remember there was like there's days and days that we were actually having to do snow removal and things like that and and they couldn't get back to the regular duties um is there any kind of thoughts in regards to that um through you, Chair, to anybody who can answer. Uh, Chair, I'll uh, pass it over to the Secretary Treasurer. Okay. Sure. Um, I certainly I would just want to acknowledge, uh, like I think we talked about this a bit last last meeting, is you know a number of years ago there was some some pretty big cutbacks, particularly in our maintenance side uh, in the district, and so there's there's no doubt that. Um, not only is there a maintenance deficit that we have due to some of those um, issues, but but to, to your point, what additional would we be able to continue to focus on maintenance 
Uh, if we had additional support, yes. However, again, if we found $100,000 to invest in our system, I'm not sure we would invest it in that particular area. And so that's just a, always reminding of that that trade off. So, you know, um, we we've kept up as we've expanded space to add custodial uh, time to to make sure that we're not asking people or doing our best not to ask people to do uh, more with the same. Uh, but but certainly we could do more, but I, I wouldn't be recommending that expenditure based off of the, the variety of needs. Right, yeah, and we can always, you know, look at it after this wonderful season ends, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, if I may, just a quick follow up. Yeah, um, go ahead, sure. more, more of a comment than a question. Um, if we could just make sure, and I know our staff are doing amazing, trying to clear things as fast as they possibly can, removing ice, removing all of that, that yuckiness that can create quite the hazards. Um, if we could just make sure um, that we don't put the snow um, and stuff in the accessible parking spaces. Um, I've noticed businesses, many businesses do that, and I just want to make sure that I, I get that message out there. And we we continue to not do that on our end because it's really fantastic when we don't, um, especially for those family members, staff, and stuff like that that need to use those accessible parking spaces. That would be great. Thank you. Good work, everybody. Uh, Tanya? Thank you, Chantel, for saving me from having to say that. I would mention, please remember when we're icing the stairs that we could please, if we could please ice also the ramps. But that was not what I had my hand up for. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, of course, is climate change. And when we get snow, we get snow. And sometimes, like, I'm concerned that we're going to get to a point where we're not just going to have our one day where we're, we're shut down and then we can come back the next day. Have we had any thought to if we were to have like a full week closure from a big storm, uh, maybe doing hybrid using our Teams or Google Google Classroom or whatever to do to basically take our system online for a week if we needed to. And I'm not necessarily expecting an answer. It's more of a question of should we be opening up some conversations about uh, should we be tracking how many days we're impacted by snow and and do we want to have some thoughts in our minds of what we might want to do if we had that kind of a scenario uh through the chair uh to you tanya uh very much so and i think you know we always need to keep in the back of our mind that we do have minimum instructional hours in the year that we're re we are required to provide um, and in the case of a multi-day closure, uh, I think that's exactly what we would do is we would uh, move to um, some type of hybrid uh, support uh, for students working at home uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, continuity of education for sure, and also to uh, meet our requirement of our minimal in, minimum instructional hours. I see Joe's got uh, her hand up there for later. I guess my follow-up question would be, is that something that we would have to look at in terms of <clears throat> an aspect of our local agreement, our local uh, or uh, an LOU or our local bargaining agreement in terms of huh. how that would work? Uh, through the chair, I'll pass that question over to our secretary treasurer. So Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think we probably take that labor relations issue away. At yeah, it, today. yeah I mean, I'm just I wanting to make sure I'm right to think it could be potentially an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mark? Have a question? Thanks, Leanne. Uh, Jillian and Pete, thank you so much for this report. It uh, is very timely given that we're getting closer to winter. Um, I can attest that the most traction that I get as a school trustee from parents emailing me, phoning me, texting me is when it snows, they want to know if school's closing and they think I have the inside track. <laughs> um, having said that, thank you, Pete, for being mindful of single parents. As a single parent myself, it's it's difficult when the school shut down, you got to go to work and 
what do you do? Um, my advice to parents, not just single parents, is kind of keep an eye on the weather and see if it's coming and make a game plan. Uh, um, that's what I do. Uh, in terms of question, I do have a question, and this Mark might know this. Um, have we ever uh, had the city of Nanaimo or uh, the town of Ladysmith sort of take us to task or, you know, for falling behind because we're unable to fill the positions to to get things done in a timely manner? Has that happened? And, and um, are we at risk of that this year? So thank you for the question. We have an excellent relationship with the city of Nanaimo and 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 the town, all our jurisdictions, but particularly the city of Nanaimo and and the town of Ladysmith. And um, so I understand that if we there are any concerns, that we kind of get shared rather than go fix this. Because I mean, I think you, you can see a lot of places that uh, are sometimes slow off the hop to to do their what their responsibilities are. But again, the board had expressed some concerns maybe four years ago that did actually cause us to. Make make some investments, mainly in equipment that has brought our response time significantly up. So there I'm not aware of any concerns that have been raised like we get neighbors that go, hey, this is not done. And then we take a look just to to make sure we didn't miss it to see where it is on the 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 track to get done. But with respect to the city, no, I, I think uh, it's been quite good, particularly since we've made recent investments. Thank, thank, thanks, Mark. And i am just ask uh, for those uh, watching that, uh, you know, it is cold and flu season and, and that's when the snow hits. So sometimes it is difficult to get people out. So be kind in your phone calls and come with it from a expression of, uh, you know, a bit of compassion for our staff. And thank you very much, Pete and Jillian. And um, yeah, that's that's all I got. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to go circle back to Naomi. Sorry, I missed you. I scrolled down the screen there. So. Hi, thanks. Uh, that's all right. Um, yeah, I thank you very much for this report and this explanation because I know as a trustee when we have called snow days, I've been, um, you know, on the receiving end of some emails and like upset parents. Um, I think um, one of the things that I, I I didn't really see in the report, but I had one, I had some parents phoning me like, you know, because we cover a large area, um, there are some areas that get snow and some areas that don't. Um, and uh, I know that in the last um, big snow dump we had um, two years ago, I guess, almost two years ago, um, there was a, the schools were open, but there was some areas that were really quite dangerous um, for getting out. Like out, I think it was out in Yellow Point, um, sort of area where North Oyster is and all that. And I'm just wondering, like when we, um, in those situations, do we just base it on like how many schools potentially can, can be open? Because the roads are clear enough or whatever. Is that how we make that decision? Uh, through the chair. Um, to you, Naomi, uh, yeah, uh, you just uh, identified um, <laughs> one of the challenges and you know that you are absolutely correct. We can have a day where uh, schools, you know, closer to the water uh, have very little snow and, and schools in the further reaches of our district have a lot of snow. Um, it is almost impossible to just close a few schools or leave a few schools open. So you basically need to make a decision for the district. But what's important in the messaging, and Jillian, you can comment on this as well. And you know what I always say to parents is um, you are not required to bring your child to school. So at any time, if you feel that your personal situation, your clothes, your road is unsafe, please uh, feel free to keep your child at home that day. Um, so, so yes, uh, the determination is made to keep all schools open or close all schools. 
uh, but it is also equally important to express to parents that we do not want them to risk unsafe conditions uh, just to get their child to school. So, and I see Jillian's popped up as well. So go ahead, Jillian. Yeah, I'll just add uh, to Pete's comments uh, that we are sending out a uh, communication uh, in the next couple of days outlining our process and procedure for communication for closures due to uh, snow days and that information is included there for parents as well. So they will be getting it very soon in their email inboxes. Thanks, did you have a follow up Naomi? No, I didn't, thank you very much. All right, uh, Greg, you're next. Yes, thank you, Chair. Through you to staff, I was hoping Jillian might be able to expand a little bit on school messenger uh, communications of um, the snow events. And um, I was under the impression that, that we used to have an app, and I just wondered if we changed that direction. I, I saw it on my phone, and then my phone says it's no longer available. So I'm just hoping you could help me understand that a little bit, and the people at home, the best way to receive um, notifications from us. I know the report says the radio and school messenger and an alert on the website, um, but the school messenger part uh, I'm not familiar with. So can you help us understand that a bit, please? Absolutely. School Messenger is our mass notification system. Um, so it's its own uh, messaging platform and we can go in there and we're able to um, message every family in the district. Um, and that's where when families provide their contact information at the beginning of the year and a primary contact and a secondary contact, uh, we have that um, in a database and uh, we can select text messaging, email or phone or all three. Um, and it's pretty um, uh, instantaneous. So as long as it takes me to write a message and hit send, it's going into uh, it's it's phone calls are being made and it's similar if you have alert ready, if you're with the regional district or um, the city of Nanaimo, those are somewhat similar um, apps, although people, our families don't have to sign up for School Messenger, we automatically add them into it. Um, so it's a very fast and efficient way to reach out to people um, and uh, reach them at the contact information that they've given us. We will not use phone calls um, for snow days because they do happen very early in the morning and not everyone uh, is pleased by a call that early, but texts um, you know, are quite instantaneous and, and most people are able to have some kind of alert uh, to when a text comes in. Um, Speaking to the app, um, I don't have the full history on that app or why it's not active anymore. Um, predates my time here. Uh, what I can tell you is that I do know that it isn't active um, and I couldn't tell you when uh, that happened. Um, however, um, we are as a communications department uh, taking a good look at all the platforms out there for uh, school communications, and that includes websites, um, that includes um, various um, uh, websites that also include an app um, component to them as well. There's a wide variety of companies out there doing some really amazing things uh, in terms of getting in people information, you know, in the way that they want to receive it uh, in a convenient way. And that for most people, that's their phones. Um, so the, that particular app won't be coming back, but we are um, looking around to see um, what uh, progressive um, and what platforms would best fit our school district for our needs. That's the most important thing. Um, what do we need as a district? What do our families want? And how do we best serve everyone? So may I have a follow up chair? So I just want to confirm what I my understanding then. So as long as parents have provided um, their contact information with the district when they register their child and their phone numbers haven't changed, they will receive an, uh, a notification through the school messenger system in the morning when the decision has been made. That is correct. And Thank our you. 
our schools are great at following up with all families if they haven't received that con contact sheet back. Um, so everyone, every single family who's provided their contact information is in School Messenger. Great, thank you. Thanks, uh, Jillian. Just while you're on here, I think this is like a great time to just remind people that a, an email did go out regarding communications to date asking um, families how they prefer to be contacted. So if you haven't seen that, maybe check your email and um, do us a favor and respond to that so that we can collect some great information. Thanks. So, don't know if you wanted to say anything. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say um, I checked the responses uh, to that a little earlier um, before this meeting and we're already over 500 responses. To, so thanks for to everyone who took the time to share their information. It is really valuable feedback. I was very impressed and very grateful. Thank you. Uh, OK, Joe, you're next. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, the first one is uh, with regard to closures and meeting minimal hours, I know that we already exceed the ministry minimum. And so that does provide a little bit of wiggle room in terms of when school closures happen. Um, and flipping classrooms is a really challenging thing to do. Uh, I know teachers did it in a week during COVID, which was remarkable and uh, certainly commendable and many other industries took six months to do what we did in six days uh, and I'm um, grateful to colleagues for that but it is not something that teachers can do without a degree of notice and so um, flipping a classroom is is a challenge and and the other piece to that is that teachers provide education and not child care so there are wonderful child care providers in the world, but it is our job to educate students. Um, we are not their child care providers, so just wanted to mention that too. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, Tom, you're next. Hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you to, um, I don't know, anyone who can answer. Um, this is great information, Pete. I'm just wondering, how do these guidelines apply when the inclement weather comes while the school day has already begun? Do we have similar policies and procedures uh, about when we and on what conditions we move to early dismissal, that we start notifying parents, that we think about an early end to a day when the weather comes midday? Um, through the chair, <laughs> I'm smiling, Tom, because you just described my worst nightmare, uh, which <laughs> is when the storm rolls in at one o'clock in the afternoon. And yeah. uh, so in, in answer to your question, um, we also very closely follow the weather forecast. And if it looks like there's going to be a big storm rolling in uh, midday, uh, I've certainly made the decision just to close the schools for the day. Uh, in anticipation of that and sometimes I've been right and sometimes I've been wrong um, and also you know if we are totally surprised then we absolutely uh, if we see conditionings worsen uh, worsening throughout the day uh, we absolutely reach out and and contact parents and say we're having early dismissal today um, you need to arrange to have your children picked up or come and pick up your children uh, so again you know it's very much um, judgment in an evolving situation. Yeah, thank you. I've lived through a couple and it did survive, but it, it, it often feels like, um, you know, like, like we're kind of playing it by ear a bit. Um, so I guess as a follow up, if I may chair. Yeah, I'm just wondering. So in some of those situations, even though with our best efforts, we're going to find some vulnerable students that are not able to be picked up and not able to to get where they're going. And what do we do in those situations? Um, through the chair, uh, Tom, uh, thank you for for bringing that up. So uh, safety is always the number one concern. And um, as a school principal myself, and it is an expectation of school principals, uh, to ensure that all students are safe. So if a parent cannot come to the school uh, until 
uh, regular dismissal time, uh, then we keep the children at school safe until the parents able to make it there. So we ensure that every child is looked after um, as long as they need to be looked after to to make sure that they have a safe way home. That's great to hear. Thanks, Pete. And thank you to our staff that make that uh, make that happen under short notice. Thank you. Pete, did you have anything else to add or I just see? Yes, thank you, Chair. If you if you'll just indulge me for a moment, I just want to share my favorite snow day story. Uh, one day I decided to keep the schools open and of course my email uh, was flooded with parent comments, but um, one of the high schools uh, actually launched an email writing campaign to the superintendent. So. I received over 350 of uh, the most interesting emails from students, and I was thoroughly impressed with their initiative and creativity. Uh, so I stayed up most of the night replying to all of them. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not encouraging every student in the district to email the superintendent, but uh, it was an enjoyable snow day for me. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, all right, I see no other questions, uh, so we can move on and hopefully away from the snow for a long amount of time. Um, we have no correspondence, um, no unfinished business, so we'll move on to new business 11.1. Um, Greg is going to talk to us um, regarding a notice of motion regarding policy 2.1. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as the committee is aware, we've become um, aware that policy 2.1, the role of the board, is in need of a little maintenance. Um, specifically, this came up and uh, bringing this forward as a result of some conversations regarding uh, the number um, three in the policy in relation to the board's role in selecting the superintendent, secretary, treasurer, and deputy superintendent. And um, so that facilitated the need to um, bring this forward. And I don't want to go too far until we have a second year on the motion, but um, that's why it's here today. So, um, Chair, I'll, I'll read the motion if that's okay. And then, or if you'd like to pause and have questions first, that, I'll leave that to you. Um, yeah, well, let's go with the questions. Um... Greg, just so that that way um, everyone can have a chance if they have a question. OK, let's give them a second here. I don't see any questions at this moment, so um, if you want to go ahead and read the motion. Thank you. Uh, the motion reads that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District number 68 Nanaimo Ladysmith amend the policy committee work plan to include the review and update of policy 2.1 role of the board. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Tim. Did you want to motivate Greg? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just say I sort of did already and I was trying not to, but I think I needed a little bit of an introduction. Um, I'll just say that the, you know, I acknowledge that the policy committee work plan is already very full, um, but this came up in some of our previous discussions as needing a bit of a review. And the way that we do that is we uh, request that the board amend the work plan, and that way um, the policy will get slotted into the work plan and we'll get to it eventually. So um, bringing this forward as as we had um, previously discussed and hopefully we'll get support from the board and be able to add this to the policy work plan for review. All right, thank you. I don't see any questions um, in the chat, so uh, we'll just call the question. Um, is there anyone opposed to the motion as read? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, snow for information. Karen, are there any questions? No questions. Thank you. Oh, Leanna. 
Hi, sorry. Um, I just forgot that I didn't say anything about Angie um, joining us from DPAC. So at our last AGM, which was a week ago, Angie has taken on um, Education Committee and Business Committee. So you'll see her on there and um, she's lovely instead of Jessica for the year. Thank you, Liana. Welcome, Angie. All right, um, so I'm going to say hi, Sepka. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming and I will um, look for a motion to adjourn. Gento. And seconded by Greg. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.